our last featured speaker is Mark Coetzee, and he said he was going to shake it up. So I don't know what you planned, but that's what you said you were going to do. Um, Mark has been the director for the Rubel Family Collection in Miami since the year 2000. And he, like Bernie, is also originally from Cape Town. And that's where he founded the Fine Art Cabinet, which was a not-for-profit space where he curated over 60 exhibitions focusing on artists from the region. And it was there that Bernie Searle had her first show. Cozy has published extensively on art, writing for journals Mail, Guardian, Review Noir, and the Sunday Independent, among many others. He's published over 30 monograph catalogs on various artists, and his most recent book, Not Afraid, Rebel Collection, was published by Fidon Press. His recent curatorial projects, and boy, have you been busy, include Life After Death, The New Leipzig Painters, which he co-curated with Laura Heon of Site Santa Fe. And it was the first painting exhibition mount mounted at Mass Mocha. It continues its national tour in Seattle next year at the Fry Art Museum. The traveling exhibition, Memorials of Identity, a new media project that has just closed at the Nasher Museum, that's at Duke University, and which then will open at the Haifa Museum in Israel next year. He also is working on an exhibition, or has just completed the exhibition, Eberhard Havakost, a mid-career survey of this Dresden painter, which is currently on view at the Katz and Art Museum and at the American mm -hmm. University in Washington, D.C., will come to the Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, and you can see it at the Tampa Museum of Art in 2007. The Rebel Collection will open Red Eye Los Angeles Artists from the Rebel Family Collection on December 4th. That was his most re recent project. And for those of you visiting Art Basel in December, please be sure to see that exhibition. Mark? Um, so what I'm going to do is attempt to do what I'm going to attempt to do is not the impossible. Um, Bernie's work has always been profound for me because of the complexities and to a certain extent the way it opens things up but the, also the way that it doesn't allow it to be accessible unless you understand the specificities of where it comes from. And that's something that I like a lot, in the sense that um, each of us have a particular experience, each of us have a particular background, and some of those things will always remain ours, um, no matter who or how anyone tries to decode them or contextualize them, and I think that that's something that I think is very important for me in contemporary art. You know, um, a lot of art that um, we look at seems boring, it seems difficult to access, it seems um, almost oblique. And it's just recently that I've started to understand that that's fine. Um, not that I'm saying your work is boring or oblique, but <laughs> I just like the things that um, sometimes things are not completely accessible. Um, and that my experience of your work here is completely different because it's through an eyes of some, in some way, of an American institution. And I'm starting to see how certain things translate and certain things don't. Anyway, um, what I'm going to try and do is explain the history of art that was being taught when Bernie and I were growing up. Um, then, and literally do that for two minutes, <laughs> then try and explain the history of art that was being told or imposed or debated when Bernie and I started our careers. Um, I'm speaking about Aqui en Wazor and the second Johannesburg Biennale and the huge debate that happened around that. And then I thought um, perhaps to talk about a few international artists, so to do what Laurie's done with Africa, but to do that on the international spectrum. And um, I'd like to make a comment 
um, before I start like with my history lesson, and that is, you know, I don't care if African artists are good. I just care if artists are good. And I think that um, something that's been a good learning experience for me is that um, we've created this diaspora, this language, this conversation, which can be so suffocating and such a ghetto sometimes. And um, what I want to do is to show seven artists who I believe are great new media artists and um, perhaps suggest how your work is within a dialogue with that. And its dialogue is not about the specifics which I referred to earlier. So we're looking at an artist called um, Jakob Pianif, and I'm just going to give you his birth date, 1886 to 1957. There's two particular South African artists who still have um, dominated the South African market. Now you might say, well, aha, he's from a collection and he's going to talk about the market. Um, but we live in a time when the market, to a large extent, is dominating the art conversation. We can't get away from that. And to a large extent, unlike perhaps in Clement Greenberg's time, when the critic defined value systems, now the market is much more dominant in that. And it's kind of ironical that the two artists, um, Jakob Pianif and Irma Stern, still, who are pretty problematic within the, the, the tradition of the colonial gaze, are still the artists that gain the highest prices ever, I think, um, of South African art. Um, and Pianif, it's really funny because when you look at these images, you might think, okay, well, there's a kind of a reference to landscape painting, there's a reference to early modernism, perhaps a touch of impressionism in the later work. Um, but I came across a quote of his um, when I was still at Stellenbosch University, one of the great, um, what can I say, strongholds of apartheid. Um, where Pianif, in letters to friends, explained that he wanted to paint the African landscape devoid of human presence to indicate it was ours, I suppose within the European sense, ours for the taking. And um, I think that's why I want to start here, because Bernie's work places the body right in my face. I mean, you cannot deny the physicality of this woman. And um, it's such a contradiction, it somehow negates completely everything that Pianif stood for, um, which I love, you know, I mean, because there's been such obvious um, political statements, let's say, um, and heavy symbolism, which so many South African artists have done to try and break down this tradition. Then I'm going to show you some examples of Irma Stern. Um, who, to a large extent, um, is still respected. She has a museum dedicated to her, which is run by the University of Cape Town. But um, I don't even have to explain to you about the problematics of exoticism, of representing the African as the innocent, as the beautiful, as the colorful clothing, you know. Um, and so it's kind of curious that from this Christian national education, which I was brought up in, and I'm sure Bernie might have had the same experience, um, we seem to take like a huge jump with the opening up of South Africa the symbolic end of apartheid, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And um, we have an exhibition curated by Akwien Wazor, who many believe is the mouthpiece of Africa. Um, sometimes I agree, and he's God, and sometimes I don't agree. <laughs> like, um, he does a show and invites some artists to um, exhibit and all hell breaks loose because some people are not doing what other people think they should be doing now that the status quo of who has the right to represent the body 
like the power relationships change. So I'm going to show you an image of um, the Cape Town Castle. This is the oldest architectural or what would be declared as the oldest architectural building in Cape Town. I mean, obviously, um, it's kind of ironical that the archaeologists somehow don't consider that maybe stuff was there before and just didn't survive. But, um, and this is, in fact, where I met Bernie when she was showing on life's little necessities. Um, and a conversation that Bernie and I had outside the castle or in the courtyard of the castle was very pivotal for me because it was a time where everyone was super excited about the fact that we for once were being recognized as a country where there was a cultural dialogue that was valid within an international conversation that people were coming to us and talking to us and paying attention. Um, and I don't know if you remember this conversation, Bernie, but we had a conversation about how the funding was allocated within this exhibition. And there was something very curious that happened, and that was that there were certain international names which were, which were allocated huge budgets for production, and then there were local artists who were given literally pittance, like a few thousand rand, which means a few hundred dollars for their production. And it really hit me hard that walking through the exhibitions um, of the Second Johannesburg Biennale, that South African artists were capable of functioning on the level of any international conversation, but somehow they still seemed to be a different kind of apartheid. The apartheid now was a market apartheid, where, well, you're local, you get this, you're international, you're a big star, you get that. And that conversation was something that I felt this artist has moved me profoundly, and it's ridiculous that she's on a Biennale, and she's never had a major solo exhibition. So, of course, I took my space, which was the size of a postage stamp, and thought, well, let's try and extend the possibilities of people seeing this work. Um, during the Biennale, there were two or three artists which I'm going to refer to, one being um, Candace Bright's who took it upon herself to create collages of her face or black woman's faces on her white body. Um, and there was a huge dialogue that happened about this. Manette Vari, um, you can look at the shapes of the body. I don't want to go there. It seems too um, obvious to explain. Um, the publication came out after that called Grey Areas, where everybody had the opportunity to voice their concerns about for or against the politically, politi politically correct um, positions on who has the right to represent who. And um, I don't, I mean, it's almost impossible in these kind of conversations which are so charged with agendas to somehow even find uh, the correct position. Um, but again, I kept thinking about Bernie's work um, within this because I thought to myself, Yara is an artist who clearly represents the specificities of who she is, no matter how complex or multi-referential that might be and doesn't put herself in a position where she tries to speak for somebody else. You know? And I think that, um, for me, that's very important. Um, I'm going to show you two more pictures of South African artists before I move on to a more international spectrum. But um, this is a work by a white artist called Lynn Boerter, a profoundly good, kind person. Um, and again, I don't think I need to even explain the problematics of the image. Um, I think it was a very difficult um, situation for many artists who were educated within a Christian national system about how you represent things, to have this radical change with this kind of international dialogue that happened, which nobody's, and you had a whole group of artists who somehow wanted to be part of that, but couldn't be. And again, it all came down to that very difficult thing of the body, and who has the right, and 
even the way that your skin color really gave you the right to do certain things. Um, and then again, Candace Bright's more recent work that was shown at the Harlem Museum, I think about two, three years ago, um, where she's taken um, Tupix, I think you guys call it white out, and she's whited out the skin of these women and turned them into Caucasians, I suppose. Um, and again, Tracy Rose, the Lolita that Laura was referring to, where there's this white stuff that changes her skin. Um, now you might say, well, what has he told us? Um, I'm not really sure what I'm telling you. All I know is that it's a very radical thing for a South African artist to take possession of their own history and their own body. We come from a culture where, um, and specifically, so many artists came from a culture where these things were really decided for you. And um, I think that it's very interesting for me listening to Bernie when she's talking about the details within her work. But for me, it's just profound to actually have this body right in front of me, which I cannot deny and which will not go away, no matter what I do about it. You know, I can't classify it. You know, even though you try and color yourself in a way which is um, camouflaging yourself in a way, it doesn't go away. And um, I think that, that for me is um, an extraordinary thing for an artist to do because we're constantly exposed to images in our daily lives where um, we've just become completely blind to any presence of anything and it bothers me when I think of your work because um, I want those images to go away, in a way. Um, just like um, Pianif's images have gone away. Um, and I'm not sure how that happens. Um, so let me close this and I'm going to try and... So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot through very quickly seven artists. I'm going to start with William Kentridge, who I'm all sure you're familiar with his work, um, and just give you like two or three sentences on the way that these artists have dealt with the body, identity, memory, history, um, reference, and um, the way that they're using these references of identity or memory to define themselves. Um, I'm just going to shoot through some of these. Um, William Kentridge, as you know, his work refers directly to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, and the horrors of apartheid, but um, Something that was interesting for me when I was growing up, something that was interesting for me when I was growing up, was that um, to a large extent nobody had the voice to say anything against this dominant Christian national voice that was required of artists. And um, if a journalist tried to do something, they were silenced. If an artist tried to do something, their work was banned or taken off the walls. If an academic tried to do something, they lost their job. And William f found a way, like perhaps um, an historical character like Goya, to discuss what was going on, to represent the horrors of what was going on in a way that he could get away with it, um, but still communicate to us in South Africa and the outside world um, almost to open up a dialogue. Um, and for me, that was a, a very important thing as a, as a young art person in the country because it made me realize that um, you can do something which seems so poetical 
that you can't pinpoint the exact historical or political reason for its being, but in fact, it can do it even more so. And I, I think that relates to your work as well a lot for me because um, Sophie and I were just speaking about how, and this is something I'll never understand, but how do people who are not South African with our experience understand your work? Because I look at the image of Table Mountain and I have references to that which I can't imagine um, an American would have. References they might have to I don't know, um, the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty, which I'll never have. Um, and um, I thought that that was something that was interesting about your work too, because I'll never forget when we did your show in Cape Town, um, how profoundly uncomfortable the viewers were with your work. And um, it was a big learning experience for me when the work was up, and of course Bernie had finished installing and the opening night had happened, and I had to deal with the onslaught of the public and how angry they were that how dare she do this, you know, because, you know, you should know your place. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a very difficult time for any woman, I think, in a macho patriarchal society to establish an authoritarian voice, a position, an opinion, and then to do it in a way where you not only question your right to speak for yourself, but you, have, you question the right to how your body is represented, um, how it's represented, and also refuse um, to do it in a way which is fulfilling traditional Western concepts of beauty and attractiveness and like, you know, the kind of the body that is required of us should we represent ourselves photographically. Um, and I think that's also something that taught me about the responsibility of us that are involved in art, how we have to stand behind these difficult questions that artists ask us. Um, this is an Israeli artist, Sigele Landau. Um, what she does is she went to a beach in um, Tel Aviv. She made herself a hula hoop out of barbed wire. And the performance is that she stands on the beach and twirls this barbed wire around her body over and over and over again. And you can see how the flesh eventually becomes erupted by this performance. Um, I love the way that the hula hoop almost slices off the woman's head. Again, symbolism which is obvious, you know, the barbed wire referencing um, the Holocaust, the concentration camps, but also the crown of thorns within the, the Christian tradition. Um, a Vietnamese artist, Yun Ngujin Hatsushiba. Um, he was commissioned to do a piece um, uh, to create a memorial to the Vietnam War and the, specifically the after effects of the Vietnam War. And instead of building a block of stone or a piece of marble, he makes this performance video where he gets these guys to push these tricycles, which would be used for public transportation across the ocean floor. Um, and somehow this relates just the beauty of the image a lot for me to your work in the sense of um, the Suomoi, it's so beautiful, but it's so profoundly violent and disturbing and impossible that these human beings have to walk across the floor and can't breathe and have to constantly go towards the surface for air. Um, and again, there's a lot of political references in this piece, like with your work, um, where these tricycles are being banned by um, the Vietnamese government in an attempt to modernize the nation, but at the same time, the livelihood of a lot of people are being taken away. Um, but it's something that I really want to emphasize with my response to your work, and that is that um, those things are really after the fact. Those, 
symbolic narrative stories. It's, um, you know, if the, the, Im the image is so profoundly strong and moving, and if that can hold my attention long enough, you know, it works, yeah. Sven Paulson. Um, maybe I should speak a little bit about my particular relationship to Tampa. Um, I don't know if you know, but I actually first got to know about the Rubel Collection because of the University of South Florida. Margaret did a show with Amy Capalozzo many, many years ago, which was selections from the collection that I work for. And it, I somehow got one of those little pamphlets and thought, hmm, this is interesting. I need to f see this when I get to Miami. Um, six years later, I live in the building which those objects came from. Um, you know, Isabel, I don't know where you are. Um, oh, <laughs> who did our curatorial program is now working on a project for CAM. Um, and who helps me with projects um, for education and we hijack Alexa and Margaret's office. And I start a project with Bernie six or seven years ago and we meet in Tampa. And it's really, really funny how like the art world makes these incredible relationships which you don't even realize you have. This is a piece by um, uh, um, Nordic artist Sven Paulsen and he did a residency in New York and decided to do a road trip um, across Florida, you know, like, just like the images I showed you of Irma Stern, the prejudicial view of the African as exotic, as innocent. We have these images of you, of, you know, hamburgers, french fries, road trips, um, and he wanted to do this. So he went on this road trip and his work profoundly changed. Um, in, when he started to encounter the urban sprawl in Tampa and Fort Myers, and um, started to make these computer-generated images. And when I spoke to him about why, because I wanted to somehow understand how this dealt with identity, he said that you will see that my landscapes are always devoid of human presence. And I thought, oh my God, I'm back in high school being taught you know, about PNF again. Um, and these images are, ex in fact, from Tampa, which he photographed and then... So um, I love the way that this is kind of... Tampa's an international meeting point, if that makes any sense. <laughs> um, and I, I like this work because so much of the work that I see that deals with the body or with identity in an international kind of arena sometimes is so heavy in its obvious representations of politics and power and um, violence and abuse and whatever. And um, I love the way that he manages to create a landscape almost like, um, oh, I just saw a show at the Getty, uh, I can't remember now, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, creates an environment where I'm so achingly looking for the presence of that body and the marks of that body, like in your work, that it almost pains me just as much to say, you know, just let me see the effects of our time, just like your work refers to the kind of the effects of your own time, but also your history. Um, I think one of the great video artists working today, Henri Sala, this is a piece called Intervista. Um, he finds a videotape or a film um, with his mother on it, and the soundtrack has been lost. And he goes to great lengths to find the soundtrack for the film and then discovers that his mother was part of the um, Socialist Soviet Party um, in um, Albania and she then denies that she was, or then she denies that she said that, and then he goes to a school. I don't know if I have images of it. That's his mom when she was young. I don't think I have images, no. Um, he goes to a school um, for, the, uh, for people who can't speak and hear, and gets them to mouth read what his mother's saying, to lip read, and then he brings it to her and confronts her. 
And at first she denies that she said it. And he has, he's explaining to his mother um, the work of the Marxist-Leninist party. It's actually coming out of her mouth. And she's denying it. And he says, but mum, that's what you're saying. And eventually she says, well, I'm sure I said it, but I wouldn't have said it that badly. And she starts fighting about linguistics. And um, again, this work kind of had a relationship for me with your work because um, it's very difficult, I suppose, to confront our own pa pasts. And um, when, you know, humans have the selective memory in a way, we like to eradicate certain things. And somehow, for a South African anyway, you keep reminding me of those things. Um, so there's kind of a love-hate relationship with the work, which is, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But <laughs> Fiona Tan, um, what Fiona does is she went to the um, National Film Archives in the Netherlands and pulled out images which were lodged in the archive. And just through the careful editing of the images, creates a very um, disturbing remembrance of the way that we've been inclined in our history to represent the other, the exotic, the one far away. Um, and yeah, we see the perpetrator of the, I don't know if one should say the crime, but um, it's so interesting for me that with the history of photography and the way that photography was going to replace painting in its representation of the world, in the recording of the real, um, that it became the tool of the anthropologist and the colonialist to document the moment before they eradicated, the moment before they destroyed. And somehow I like the fact that so many performative artists who are dealing with taking ownership of the writing of their own history are specifically using the medium of photography to again, not only take back one's writing of one's own body or one's own history, but also to take back the writing of the medium itself and to say even that we have the right to use that medium ourselves. And the last piece, Artur Zimajewski, um, he's a Polish artist. He goes to Israel and he asks um, um, Jewish immigrants to sing songs from their childhood. And whether it be because they've been gone so long or whether it be because they go in senile or can't remember, they find it very difficult to recall the lyrics to the songs, which were so much part of the upbringing. And um, when, you were, when I heard the faint sounds of your son, it was very moving for me to think about this piece, because even that oral tradition um, somehow is rewritten each time we tell it. And, um, I think some people might feel that's unfortunate that that history is lost, but I like that, that in the process of your work, you rewrite in some kind of history just within the same tradition that Zimajewski is doing or even that your son is doing. And um, I think for me, it's beautiful that artists can take on that responsibility, um, that they the ones who will rewrite it for us, perhaps with slightly more sensitive agendas involved. So, um, as I said when I began, um, sure, there's a long dialogue that Bernie's work counteracts. Um, there's also a particular pertinent place for Bernie's work in a 
in the right conversations, let's say, those conversations which are very sexy and very cool um, with the way that the outsider has become the mainstream, the way that New York and Paris and London are no longer the centers of cultural discourse, that the fact is that all of us, whether we be in Cape Town or Tampa or Miami, or that we can actually be part of a mainstream discourse. Um, but like I mentioned in the beginning, the thing that's very important for me about Bernie's work is that it's not merely based in its history and it's not only based within that dialogue within the African diaspora, the African intelligentsia, wherever that might be situated, but that somehow it's part of a dialogue about the problematics of identity and memory and change and how impossible it is to actually situate those problematics, those, it's almost impossible to get a fixed sense of a defined person with value systems, with references, with a stable kind of moral grounding because the very thing that we ask artists to do is the minute we've established those defined grounds is to shake them up and to give us something new and to challenge everything that we expect about from ourselves and others. And um, I think that's why um, I've always wanted to have a conversation with you about your work and I'm still fascinated by your work because somehow it refuses to only exist within ghetto conversations but that does actually dialogue with the specific concerns of a whole group of artists working all over the show. And um, I know that you've had a pretty um, successful career, but what I'm looking forward to now is to actually seeing how you find your place within a much more larger international um, respect. Um, because part of my job is to constantly be looking at and engaging with the latest, most seminal pieces of art which represent our time. And as I see your new work, and I compare it to work which a consensus has already been formed about, I'm glad that there's a dialogue, whether it's intended or not, between your work and their work, so. Cool. <laughs>